So my name is Alistair Banks. For those who won't be at my uh, networking talk this af af afternoon, I'm a solutions architect. That's my title. I'm from a consulting company called 318. Uh, we're headquartered on the left coast in Santa Monica with a few locations around the country, including the one I'm from in New York City. <coughs> you should follow me on the Twitter at Sacrilicious, or you can contact me by email. There's people that really like email, you know. Uh, I love my ridiculously short domain name and email address, abanks at the numbers 318.com, or I have a personal domain, al at aru-b.com. In my session description, I said we'll be going over what models work to protect data, who are the players, and uh, I really like that show, How It's Made, like how they make aluminum foil. It's totally awesome, right? Like among the sheets and, okay. Hopefully we'll leave this session with a firm agreement uh, on the terms and discuss solutions in the future and plans to implement not just appropriate collections of archived data, uh, but to verify the data regularly to ensure gravity works. So we start off talking about why you'd even need to implement a project like, you know, having backup is that you've done an architectural investigation into that common unit that we all operate on, uh, that the backups need to then ensure and protect just data, just files. Then the study of what it's all about is semi buzzword termed information lifecycle management. There's asset management and workflow systems that have set a precedent. But I decided to move so forward with a somewhat independent method, although it's, it's nothing special. Uh, it's just about getting answers to the common questions across the system that you support in what I'll term the investigation stage. Okay, you start out, how is the data grouped? You, all of these organizations, they produce something that they want to hold on to, and that they group it in some type of maybe logical way. Uh, for what purpose and how long is it actively worked on? So just like there's an there's a actual life cycle. It lives and it dies. People have these templates that they use. They reuse them. They move on. What file types? What sizes? What's the fidelity of the data? If there's multiple versions that are automatically created as part of the workflow, what uh, metadata is in use on those files and you know, ensuring that they, the baby does not get thrown out with the bathwater? Does data production, the rate of creating these files, does it exceed the available storage on an ongoing basis? What expectation for whole copies? How many snapshots in time do we want? How are we, how are we going to retain those copies? Do we need to put them near line? Is it okay that they stay offline for any period of time or after a certain stage? Then you'll move on and you'll draft up policy. You'll have service, uh, SLAs, which is an acronym that I didn't write down for myself to remember. Service level, Service level agreement. You'll understand what the worst case scenario is. You'll look at who your stakeholders are and you'll use all those businessy terms because sitting in meetings is a lot better than doing work. You'll plan. You'll arrange to evaluate certain products. You'll compare those products. You'll order the necessary equipment. You'll deal with all the logistics. I have to install this storage system. I need to let it format. I've decided to use this type of policy. I'm going to use my hot spares. I'm going to have cold spares. I'm going to you know, keep things near where they need to be and just get the system up and going in a reasonable amount of time. But I need to get all those, those steps in place first. Then you implement, you put the system in place, including the scheduling and the automation because humans are the severely limiting factor. So as much uh, that you can keep in mind for over-engineering and uh, out-engineering the human element without building up insurmountable technical debt, the better off you are. You, you need to just, every point of interaction that a human can make a decision that could probably you know, shoot themselves in the foot, most often with a shotgun, you want to try to avoid that. Then you test. It is not over. When the backup ran and it said, I completed successfully. You are not done. You have to look the, at the proper retention, the proper availability, the fidelity of those files, the affected parties that want to get at those files. How do they get it back to them? 
They need, also need documentation and training pushed to them. They are not going to pull it, but you, you, we can hope so, and we also try to make it available to them. At uh, LOPSA earlier this month, there was uh, the local to Manhattan sysadmin who was in town, therefore, when the Stack Overflow suite of sites experienced a little, you know, hurricane. And uh, they were dumb lucky that they had been practicing flipping over to their DR site. Dumb lucky! They had a DR site! It was on the other side of the country. They were ready to go by sheer luck. And they did, had not fully automated their system. And so they all got on a Google Hangout and they all just talked it out and went through those steps. However, when you're in a disaster and communication is your number one priority to actually stay on page, and luckily, you, you know, you're going to want to rehearse it. You're going to want to actually be okay and not like me is right now with my heart going 140 BPM. You do not hire a firm for PR handling the disaster when your CEO or dean has already forgotten to put their foot in their mouth and alienated your customers. You want a PR firm that you can trust beforehand, right? So like the PR firm will have rehearsed all of the scenarios that they'll go through to help you through you know, an issue to extinguish the flames before they burn down your organization. Now, as a result of going through this pre-flight, okay, I'm all, I'm all, you know, theory, and I'm talking about uh, these different steps that I just did come up with myself because I kind of thought they were logical and necessary. You've gone through all these milestones, uh, which you, you'll usually be able to get to do this though, uh, and have real buy-in after quite. Uh, Possibly what, you know, is phrased in sales as a compelling event. I mean, like, obviously this is, you know, 4200 ATA. I mean, it's, it's not, it's like, this picture's been around. But you can start to demonstrate real value when you can say, oh, you just had it in between the couch, the cushions and the couch. Let me give you your data back to you. You know, when you're there for that, that's when you're actually delivering some of that value. We don't get to do that a heck of a lot. There was an ad on the subway in, uh, in New York City that said, things break. That's why skilled technicians are always in demand. Like, that's the sales pitch that, that we have as, a, as an IT organization. Or, as the uh, tech support haiku says, three things are certain. Death, taxes, and lost data. Guess which just happened? Uh, you wouldn't really think that uh, the new org, the new foundation would have you know, jokes on their website, but they really do. So these organizations that we work for, they produce goods or services. They have information revolving around those products, the things that they create. And we're, we consider it worth holding on to for at least a reasonable amount of time, which may be closely related to human memory. I mean, the practices that we decide or what we're going to do as a business, you know, they might change over time. They might evolve. There was a, a great thought-provoking post by uh, Mark Pilgrim about how just upgrading the versions of software on a Mac. He had been there since the beginning, and the, the file formats he was using. Just going through software upgrades, he had to abandon so much of his data over time. And he got really you know, upset about that, and he wrote back in like 2006. And it's now kind of lost to the sands of time, but he moved to Linux and Ubuntu and open formats because he wanted to be able to trust that the fidelity of his data would be almost, you know, it would outlive him, maybe. It's one of those, uh, those promises that we do try to strive to if we're getting more, you know, poetic and theoretical. But, I mean, there's also systems that have now been lost to the sands of time where, like, you have an emulator and you need to write a driver for it that doesn't exist to try to get some tape media imported. And then what you do with it, because it's in a format that no longer exists, and you hope your emulator has that. There's lots of, you know, scholarly, theoretical people that are dealing with data recovery, uh, which is the important part of backup. So I think I'm talking about this for a reason. But to get back to a Mac-focused path, I'm going to do a brief rundown of my experiences uh, for what I consider the credentials I hold to be able to talk on the subject. And usually my credentials are I have a microphone. Like a lot of us in uh, early OS 10 days, I recommended retrospect as a general practice. Uh, I still use Carbon Copy Cloner. Fast forward to recent times, and I've been tinkering with the backup products on Windows and Linux servers, 
uh, those platforms with uh, other products for the Mac appearing with fits and starts to address archival and the challenge of backing up laptops at scale. And I'll end my talk with three stories of success to tell with the appropriate caveats. Instead of going straight into those products, let's uh, see what we use day to day from the command line and one-off tasks in the GUI build from there. One-offs, however, don't scale. And if it's not part of an automated system that's suitable for use by humans, you're not particularly better off. Uh, but at least these things help with data fidelity, keeping it from, I don't know, corrupting itself, one of those things, which is one of those computer science issues that come up from time to time. This is a joke. It's really funny, right? It's hilarious. Okay. Uh, when you're at a break-fix level, uh, you hear about split-half search and other troubleshooting techniques, uh, for example, to like clear bad list, plist files in the library folder, right? One way to you know keep data fidelity when trying to isolate any issue is uh, you can move half the components out of the library folder and log out and log back in. Or if you think it's a particular file, you can move that out of the way. And if you're safe to delete it, to get it out of the way uh, with this practice that I got into, you know, just right click it, compress, which according to the finder means throw it in the zip file. Uh, and that essentially is taking a snapshot on a somewhat molecular level of the entire folder before I go and touch anything. But come on. I mean, more geek cred is to, from the command line, you're going to use like something like cp to copy the file you'll modify to file.bak. How many Linux like setup guides tell you before you go and touch this thing, right? Then that's the simplest baseline that we can start with. Next is the obviously old school tape archive binary, uh, which Apple has kept updated to some extent. It can compress the files it touches, like the more modern zip or gzip, uh, different formats that you can put data into. And you're essentially mirroring a hierarchy, a directory structure, folders uh, into a container with various other options. It was obviously tuned for specific media in a time that has passed. But uh, when you just need a more reliable method of moving data into a container, it uh, does get the job done or, or zip can do that for you. And the next is Ditto. Ditto has always kept an eye on Apple-specific metadata. And it even worked not like the other Unix utilities that cared about where you put the slash at the end if you were trying to move an entire folder. It would create the directory for you if you were saying, on my destination, I want you to go into a folder called blah. It would make blah wherever your destination path was. So Ditto has these uh, idiosyncrasies. It has increases that uh, you really do get used to, unfortunately, and then the other utilities don't exactly work that same way. But uh, it, it is still kind of nice that that's there, whereas Unix utilities really do care if there's a slash at the end of the path, and now that completely screws me up. For moving files over the network, and uh, I am too lazy. Anyway, <laughs> so there's SCP. Secure copy, which you can feed a host that you can connect to over SSH uh, for either source or destination. Uh, and it would prompt you as needed to get the data moved quick and dirty, as they say. But the real Mac Daddy, the pater omnium, is the father of them all. Thank you, Googles, for telling me that that's what father of them all is in Latin, uh, is rsync, which is totally network aware and optimized. It can compress the data on send with the archive flag, or maybe it's the Z flag. Yeah, archive is keeping permissions on it. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> and it gives you more options to resume the transfers. Uh, you know, things that are intelligent, it can update on the destination and make sure it just handles differences between source and destination, you know, somewhat intelligently. But the one drawback for an out-of-the-box Mac is, yeah, 2006. There was still shipping PowerPC back then. So, obviously, we haven't been seeing too much love on the rsync bundled with the OS front, just like yesterday we were talking uh, in, in here, no? It was, it was a couple doors down about how Python is still a 2.7. People are grumbling about the old version of Ruby. I mean, anyway. 
building your own requires a few Apple specific patches if you're building from source for rsync because this is, you know, a rather Unixy uh, util. But uh, that's been well documented by the creator of Carbon Copy Cloner, Mac Mike Bombic, uh, and his own custom patched version is accessible. If you specifically use the entire path, there is, there, rsync is above here. Yeah, my slides are awesome. Uh, although it, his version has particularly verbose output because he wants to be able to debug things. You don't actually see his rsync running when his, his program is, is operational. And I wouldn't be covering all the bases unless I mentioned tmutil, dot, 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 which my boss will tell me that's an ellipsis because he's a better writer than I am. Uh, it has somewhat limited utility in practical use. I don't end up using it so often because, hey, it's, yes, the front end for Time Machine, or back end, or, yeah, Time Machine's awesome. The thing that is awesome about Time Machine for me is one of those times uh, since, well, the most previous time I can think of after Fall Vault 2, that there was a big plumbing change that became a marquee feature. And it, it's like built on something so geeky underneath the covers that it's like, wow, you guys put a really nice, friendly front end on it. It kind of radically was optimized uh, how the OS kept track of itself, the underlying uh, feature that it's built on. I mean, Spotlight before that was another marquee feature built on something as gooey as, uh, as uh, geeky as MDFs, the meta metadata server. File system event tracking is what I'm talking about. So that's driven by dtrace, which was lovingly combined with the old school Unix, you know, ln for hard links commands so that you're not duplicating the data that you're copying in when it's exactly the same. So it's been an interesting experience to try to deploy for anything besides direct attached single workstation environments, to say the least. Uh, since we're talking about that, that level of geekiness, though, uh, I would be... You know, heretical not to mention the missive, the Syracuse, as I used to refer to it, uh, the OS X review in which the features were explained with the release of the OS uh, when Time Machine and, and 10 5, I believe. Yeah, Leopard, right. Uh, this was where it was explained to a young Padawan like myself, page 14. <laughs> and really, he, he warms you up with uh, both DTrace and FS events in earlier pages. It's uh, understandable that something that complex is going to take a bit and cover it all before he pulls back the curtains on Time Machine, but I'm a natural pessimist. I'll cover what it doesn't do. In practice, it does not treat your network connection all that well, or more like it only wants to talk over AFP, and AFP has been found to be the most reliable of, of networking connections uh, at scale, uh, nor does it deal with less than optimal networking conditions if you want to send those backups to a server because it wants to put it in a encrypted format, or more like, I'm sorry, a uh, sparse image format, uh, they've never even exposed quotas on the server. So if you want to use a Mac server for Time Machine, literally to this day, we're at eight. It's been three versions, three new releases, and still no quotas. So you just kind of like fill it up. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's all good. And it's also dependent on FS events, which, you know, it's not necessarily the troublesome part. It's just like if you're having an issue with FS, FS events, if there's something that FS events specifically forgets about, then you're also going to have an issue. But really, what you get in practice is the countless reports of, I get to guess if the drive is failing at the source or the destination, because it thrashes the heck out of drives. And then you want to say, oh, was it doing the right thing before it failed so I can recover something from my months and months of backups? And then more common is when they go, you know, I'm tired of fighting with this thing. Dump my versions and start over because, you know, versions, which is all it does because it does not do bare metal. Like, I don't need to keep those versions. Let's just start over. Those are not good scenarios to have to be in. You know, you're be getting caught with your fly open. Uh, on the other hand, the simplicity of the implementation is nice. You know, it means you can pull out contents of past backups quite granularly. You know, you can go in and see the hard links. You can look at latest. It's a, a somewhat, you know, 
in the open file structure versus a uh, proprietary container that it's throwing stuff in. And if you're running it on Mountain Lion server, it triggers a script which will archive open directory for you uh, and Postgres SQL databases on a daily basis. Uh, if it works, because until 2.2.1 of the server.application, it had an improperly configured LaunchD trigger script. So it didn't consistently either, number one, after first being triggered to create an open directory archive, it never ran again. So as long as you don't ever add or remove any other users, you're all good. Great, you know, open directory backup, that does not backup open directory more than once. It's like, I just wanted to know what it was like when it was clean. Please bring me back to that time. Or number two, it did, does not update the associated log file. I mean, if the backup runs in the night, and no log file hears it, does it make a sound? I mean, to analyze the failures, we can take away from Time Machine as, from a model perspective, uh, as part of our data management strategy. Uh, it would be good to find a proportionately simple goal. Uh, and when I started out, I'd explain backups to customers by saying, it's just like Noah's Ark. We want two of every animal. But more recently, uh, for me, I heard the concept people refer to as three, two, one. And that is you want three copies of the important data using two different types of dedicated media, meaning what you actually store it on, uh, one of which is definitely off-site. Now, how does Time Machine stack up? Uh, while you can hack it, it only recently allowed you to have a second local backup destination, which wouldn't take over from a pre-existing one. So, like, you get a larger hard drive because you ran out of space and you want to keep more versions, and it says, oh, I'll just start over. Oh, great, thanks so much. Do appreciate that. Uh, or if you can get OS X server back up to work at scale, then good luck with that. Uh, unless you get over the network uh, to work over the WAN. If anyone in here has that working with a non-Google Fiber internet connection, and especially over wireless, I will eat my hat, which I left in my room. So, okay, maybe to be generous, it can satisfy one of the three. Maybe you can hook up and get, you know, three copies of the data by having two backups attached. All right, another craptacular backup product. Yay, okay, keep rolling. It was retrospect, but the failure isn't what it purported to do or how it necessarily, well, it's still, yeah, okay. Uh, it was the model that it was designed with. So remember when every desktop was leashed to the wall, right, with a cable, an in, in Ethernet connection, and digital cameras weren't popular, and business data was the size of text files. That's when it was designed, and an agent was installed. You get an agent, and you get an agent, and you get an agent, but the server went and knocked on all of the doors so that a sending session could begin. So you have this heavy process on the server. So it could initiate from the client to do the sending, and it packed it away in a proprietary container governed by catalog files, separate files that existed somewhere near the backup archive. So, you know, you might want to lose both of them at once. It's good to have to, an extra thing to juggle. I mean, that's what we just need in our life, more complication. The indexing implementation detail, that was great to keep, keep uh, track of, uh, that's so awesome, because if that got corrupted, as the tech haiku uh, says, an archive file that big, it might be very useful. But now it is gone. So your archive file, when your catalog file is gone, you can't do nothing with that. It's kind of awesome. Not, uh, and hoping clients could send their backups on a schedule. That kind of lacked foresight. Because over the past decade, laptops got particularly popular. And uh, they have this pesky habit of, uh, you know, not being reachable when you close the lid. So, <laughs> Retrospect outsmarted those laptops with something called proactive backup. Oh, does this sound proactive? It sounds like we're, you know, we're getting ahead of the ball, we're getting ahead of the curve. Uh, does anyone remember using proactive backup? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so they integrated it, but uh, it would pull clients and kind of try to slow them down, and, like pin them down, like long enough on the floor. Uh, Hopefully, having uh, all manner of issues, pulling that back up over the network wirelessly. 
Yeah, the whole model was just kind of a kludge. Or it could also, you know, so after it gets it together, right, it could push backups off-site with the wonderfully modern FTP. <laughs> and secure, don't get that, don't, don't miss that, it was also particularly secure, but that was before they were bought, yeah, either the second or third time, I don't know. Uh, and they tried to integrate Mosey off-site backup, and I mean, that just kind of spoiled Mosey in my mind from that point forward. It wasn't their commercials with the meteorites and stuff, it was... Yeah, I'm sorry if people use Mosey in here. I'm sure it's fine. It's just like bad taste in the mouth. All right, so I'm going to leave my bitterness behind now regarding that particular product. <laughs> There's more bitterness. Don't, don't you worry. It's coming. Uh, on to success stories. Yay, uh, the products that have at least worked for my company for that, again, buzzword because I get a quarter every time I say information like cycle management. So one thing I had to get over before I talk about, you know, the first of them is, uh, so Archiware's P5 is the new name of it, the artist formerly known as Prestor. Uh, I learned to stop worrying and, you know, just kind of love tape for what it is. Within the 321 strategy, it's not my only type of media that I'm using. Uh, there are capabilities that the hardware engineering time that's been spent on tape do buy for us for certain use cases. Uh, it can be economical, how I pronounce that, and outweigh certain negatives uh, like, you know, there's time until initial start of retrieval or time until writing when it has to arrange all of its things that it juggles around. I've just gotten over the uh, ubiquity of SATA drives, uh, giving me a sense of security uh, regarding turnaround time interacting with backup media. It just, in practice, it's not enough to worry about. Although it's still a bit too much manual interaction. Again, humans have to care where the heck tapes are. And that kind of sucks. But, you know, we'll get to the alternatives for certain use cases. I mean, Arcware also, they try to be a little bit of a jack-of-all-trades. They've got all these different flavors, which show up great on 1024 by 768, by the way. <laughs> uh, also, they don't really have a press site. But you can download scripts. It's pretty... <laughs> they're awesome. I, I don't need to, to back on them too much. Uh, so they're trying to be everything to everyone with all of these products when some portions are done better by other competing solutions. Uh, I don't fault them too much for just offering more products, though, as long as they you know, support the ones I need at the core uh, throughout time. And if you're not going to use it, you don't need to pay for those extra licenses. It'll be great out in the interface. Uh, it's not a big deal that they have a lot of them. Uh, the only other real caveat is the same with crash plan. Why the heck does it have to be so confusing to buy? And I'm just laying it out there because, you know, initially you're kind of like, okay, tape, I can get over that because it really it's optimized for uh, situations like some of the products are optimized for sending to tape. But like the pricing is through resellers only, as far as last time I checked. Uh, you have to base it on the slots in your tape library. Okay, so... I have a slot, okay. Uh, and Or if you're going to disk, it's perfectly capable going to disk. Uh, works fine. It's uh, licensed by the size of the entire destination. Okay, all right. So, all right, well, I'll get to code 42 in a second. You thought that was bad. You thought that was wacky. Uh, you thought they were just, you know, of the European persuasion. No. So, here we go. In Arcware's flagship product, they break it down to four sections. They got synchronized, backup, backup to go, and archive. Now, I can't really speak to the backup to go functionality, the laptop focused offering. I've heard good things. I just uh, don't, we don't have it uh, deployed. We rely heavily on all of the others for our customers. We even used synchronize when we're pushing assets from a podcast producer server out to other servers to, because like, clustering on OS X works really awesome, by the way. It's really great. Get set up distribution points for Apple services. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, there's crazier people who do stuff like Alexander File System or DFS, and they're multi-homing their SAN, and oh my gosh. I mean, more power to you. Uh, research organizations, they're going to do it. Synchronized SAN kind of uh, seems like a problem that no one's sorted out all that great, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Okay. Technical debt. Did I say technical debt already? Okay, so. Still, I mean, it's a little easier to set up than other products. Has anyone tried to set up Brew? I mean, it's awesome, right? It's so, wow. 
I mean, uncut. Anyway, so there's a... The, the, to go back, I mean, the sync product, you can send stuff to a data recovery site as well. Uh, the backup product, if you're doing a bootable backup, you know, that's what you want. Uh, it can run parallel to a bunch of tapes at once for increased throughput. It is optimized for large file sizes. It, it's just, it does what it does really great, and it's got great use cases within each of these silos of the products. And setting up from the command line is, is, is super good when you want to do that, when you want to integrate it with other products, when you want to automate this. That's kind of what you need. I mean, a tempo or a backbone, just trying to set those up, however, not necessarily the most intuitive, where kind of with ArcAware, it's log in, find the screen, click the button. Okay, you need, you really have a obscure use case. They probably have already scripted it. They probably have already got something for you in their magic pocket of inventory. Now, backup exec is still our recent choice for Windows servers. Because they swear that physical to virtual and restoring bare metal to non, non, uh, similar hardware is gonna work in 12. It really is. It really works now. But, uh, seriously, it's because they have the modules to back up Exchange, to back up MS SQL. Like, who cares about MS SQL? Lots of people care about MS SQL and Symantec's your, your, Bob's your uncle in that particular instance. Now I'm speaking about these modules for backup and backup exec. I am not talking today about big iron apple, right? <laughs> like, come on. I, I'm talking about Prestor as, as a solution that gets used in these use cases that's very flexible. But for Max, we're usually talking about workstations. We're talking about the lifecycle management of data in those use cases. That's why I'm focusing on the products that I'm, that I'm, that I'm talking about. Server services are limited. Uh, so like restoring PostgreSQL databases. Yeah, it, it's... Thank goodness that we're past the Lion release. Like, thank goodness. And there aren't many off-the-shelf products that are like, hey, you're in an Apple server. You want PostgreSQL restores. You want to take snapshots in time with that. You want to shard a database. No, nobody's talking about that. They're just not talking about that. So I need to talk about things that are supportable for businesses, at least for the most part, right? So we do a lot of work with uh, ArcAware's archive product uh, and my coworkers uh, kind of do more than me, but still, we've done a lot of custom development with the command line options. Uh, and with our use case is taking data offline or putting it on a shelf for 30 years, or you have a retention data for like medical where it's seven years that it has to be near line. Like there aren't systems that do this better. So you used to be able to just call Sun. <laughs> Try calling Sun now. Oracle will pick up the phone, and Iron Man will yell at you. So, press store P5 in practice. It's cheaper price points than alternatives. Just like, I'm going to be completely real about it. It's mainly that archiving use case that we see it for, which is big. I'm continually talking about, you know, buzzwordy and full lifecycle management. That's where we've had success with it and what makes it really stand apart. It's the first name that's going to be on our list when we talk about that type of thing. Crash plan. Now, my biggest caveat for, for, for CrashPlan, when we're talking about it at this conference, should have been that here I was stealing the fire of the guy going on tomorrow. Uh, and he introduced himself to me. His, his son's name is Conrad. Uh, his name is Joseph Wall. Uh, he's a very nice guy. Uh, he's from Code42, the makers of CrashPlan. It's like, well, I'm known by many names. Code42 is, is there. They will have other products eventually. You didn't hear it from me. You did not hear it from me. Uh, so that, that person, however, is from sales, losinghorns.com. Only because Andrew Renz is so freaking awesome. And he's talked at the Jam conference. He talked to us at Mac Admin Monthly at Google uh, via video conference. He's just a super on it tech. He's from the fruit company where he deployed Crash Plan. You know, so he, yeah. Anyway, when it comes to being partners with CrashPlan, like my former consultancy was before they ate our lunch, you can commiserate with me about that if you'd like. Offline, again, I'm trying not to be bitter. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, talk about, I believe that I will be covering valuable information 
sometimes I give a presentations and I have to say I A N A L, but it's more like I A N A A E. I am not an Apple employee. Sometimes I have to say that I am not a Code Forty Two employee or partner. There's, there might be some repetition. He might, he might cover some of the tough, but but go ahead and please go see his presentation because he's going to have prettier slides than me. It's it's there's no doubt. Uh, anyway, crash plan is a great example of a somewhat s specific use case. You got to understand it's not supposed to be everything to everyone. It's to disk. There's no tape option. It's not going to control your tape libraries. Some people might say hallelujah. <laughs> Other people might say. Like so, okay. Does it, you know, support SAN? Does it? Are they going to give me appliances? Yeah, they they want to sell their product. They want to, uh, and they have a particularly strange software deployment model, which is also kind of cool. So from way back, they seem to beta test early releases or newer features on consumers. You get the menu bar icon. You get sets. Uh, there's been developments that get in green first. That's kind of awesome because you know the one sum many rollout deployment. Uh, you have this green version, uh, and then they move to the smaller, medium-sized businesses. Uh, I re affectionately refer to that product as blue. Uh, and then you see the improvements in the enterprise or black version, uh, not unlike the black label twelve-year whiskey. Uh, now, the five centaur of the differentiating factors touted by all versions of the product, crash plan versus the world, are that it compresses, encrypts, and deduplicates on the client end. Remember retrospect, going around going knock knock. Please, can I have you send your stuff now? Please, I'll make a catalog over here of all your stuff. Uh, and I'm going to get into George Carlin, Carlin routines later, so. Don't don't worry who I'm impersonating right here. Uh, still, on the client end, they're doing the heavy work because CPUs they get pretty fast over time, and why not have offload the work to them? They're the ones that are going to keep track of this stuff. They're the ones that are going to do the restore. That, that's how awesome it is. You don't need to go through great clients like Retrospect. So, how does that actually benefit the process? I, I used more buzzwords, right? So there is less data to send. It's a smaller version of the data. It sent securely in a way that, if in intercepted or snooped on, it wouldn't be easily unencrypted, easily. Uh, and you can you can go crazy. You can really shoot yourself in the foot by putting ridiculously complex passwords on it. It doesn't really hurt in performance, but it did hurt me when one password totally told me that it remembered my my, uh, my archive password, and then I reinstalled, and then I kind of lost it all. But you know, I I, I died for your sins. Uh, it also ensures that it does not send the same blocks of data twice. So, what's the easiest way to explain that, right? Blocks of data, zeros and ones, sectors on a hard drive, like all of the different ways that I, that I could talk about what a block level backup is. How I like to describe it is, say you're going to LOPSA, right? And you need to do a three and a half hour training, and uh, you're going to do that same training someplace else, but like say Albuquerque, right? So on the first slide, you go, hello, Lapsa, right? And because you like saying Lapsa, you like saying League of Professional System Administrators, and you do not know how to compress your images, and therefore you have a 153 <laughs> keynote file. And then you go to Albuquerque and you say, hey, Albuquerque, because you like saying Albuquerque, uh, and you just change that first slide. So the promise is, that it will take those distinct blocks on that particular part of data that is the slide of Hello Lapsa or Hello Albuquerque and just back up Albuquerque out of that new file. You've duplicated. Everything else is the same. So it's only backing up the distinctly updated or different blocks of data. That's the, like, encryption people kind of understand. I can't get intercepted. It's going to compress it. They understand that, like, I can take a text file and I can you know, run an algorithm on it and it makes it small. So, caveats. So, you are going to want to go to this URL if you want to know about the differences between them because this is really the best, like, really, you should just look at the second line and say, okay, if I have business data, I can't send it to Crash Plan Plus. You know, I can't. 
get a all-you-can-eat plan for families and stuff. It's like, okay, please, just follow you, Liz. It's, it's not that hard, but I don't know, some places it's hard. So we're left with the choice between blue and black, and here's where it gets interesting. You cannot seed or send your backup that you've created locally to Crash Plan Blue. You can't get a hard drive back. You need to wait for that archive to come over the WAN, and it might take a bit, and it might take a bit to send. It might take months. Really, that scares people, and like, okay, fine. Maybe that's not for you. There's black, right? With black, uh, you do need to start out bringing your own infrastructure, BYOI, right? That's what's hip. Uh, you can hook up with a Code42 partner otherwise, or they can, Code42 themselves, can provide a second destination, but you need to own the master server. Okay, we're, we're organizations that are not of small sizes, I'm assuming. You want to own that master server, even if you're, even if you're humble. <laughs> you probably want to arrange getting that back up off-site yourself and not sending it over the WAN and just kind of like waiting. Uh, so the other things about the master server is that if you want to integrate with an LDAP uh, that houses the uh, accounting about your archives and all that. If you want a second destination and you want a second destination does not necessarily need to be off-site, it might be that you have a primary and a data center, right? And that your secondary is local. You, you just want, again, two of every animal, but I'll go over this. Uh, you should, they're free. It doesn't matter how many server instances you install. It's totally encrypted. If you put it at somebody's house and their maid's going to steal the computer, it doesn't even matter, right? It, it does not matter. It's all encrypted. It's a dead simple seeding process that they've worked out. Dead simple in most of the use cases, really. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Seeding to a new destination is a, a generally a non-event. But again, there's blue. There has to be some use cases that we want to use that in. I mean, it's a cloud you don't control. What, what, would be, what could go wrong? Uh, you talk about some people, uh, some about it, and it's kind of like a, a George Carlin routine. Where did you put it? I put it in the cloud. Where's the cloud? The cloud is where all the data is. Is the data, is the truth in the cloud? I hear the truth is in the cloud. Uh, I mean, blue is hard to sell customers, just like Simeon, uh, which is a monkey server for Google App Engine. The question that is hard to answer when you're trying to use those services, it's totally understandable. Capacity planning, initial usage estimates, that's what costs you money when you use these cloud services. For blue, I mean, it's 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 so simple. I mean, I mean, anybody could figure this out, right? So, ten dollars a month per workstation, or unlimited computers that fit within a shared pool of up to four terabytes. So they're kind of they're kind of putting a cap on it. That's 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 what help you got. Uh, I think they're making fun of my hand motions up there. Uh, you can fluctuate over time, and after a thirty-day trial, like. So it's month to month that you're paying, so you can mix things up after you start that trial and, you, and you've gone along. So it isn't impossible to make sense of, but it's just hard to start to have a conversation about. It might cost you something if you know what you need and you probably don't, because you don't know how much valuable data is on your machine. Uh, I don't know how to use a slide rule. It seems to be necessary. So let's assume that this audience and the folks playing along at home are individuals that uh, can get some infrastructure together. Maybe. Not sure. But that might be safe to say so. Black's not so challenging to implement. And you're wondering about other caveats for black. I mean, the takeaways when approaching the Code42 solution. One that people keep rightfully so bringing up during this conference is the fact that the Windows and Mac client software is based on Java. Now that probably won't go away anytime soon, at least on the server side, because they're doing smart things, because Java is a, is a scalable solution. It's, it's mature. It's, there's things going for it, right? So please don't worry about it on the server side. So on the Mac client, they even bundled it. That's where it is, right? Uh, to make sure that you're not necessarily worried about 
uh, updates from the vendor of the OS for your Java patches. I mean, I'm not one to uh, hold my breath, so when they say that they're going to move to native clients for all of the platforms they support, including Open Solaris, like, huh? Who puts Open Solaris on their website? Anyway, um, it's nice to have the vendor at least acknowledge an issue and commit to a fix. I mean, but you know, the software gets shipped when it's ready. I don't know. Uh, another CPP Pro E, AKA Black, AKA Black Label, uh, is again like Noah's Ark, but a step further. You want two destinations to send to at almost all times because the archives have maintenance performed on them, server side, during which you can't send as an individual client. And it seriously burns someone I know uh, who did not get in front of that before he had a compelling event, ahem, in which the location of his storage server experienced indoor showers. Uh, so the archive maintenance product used to be a lot more single-threaded. Gotten a lot better about it. Metaphorically speaking, uh, you know, it now performs maintenance one at a time per user on the server. That's a little bit more overhead for it, but they've made these efforts to lessen that failure scenario. It's a, it's a non-insignificant one. Just have two destinations, they're free, it's cool. Just, you need the storage, you need the bandwidth, but uh, that non-consecutive maintenance that they've also uh, implemented uh, it does alleviate that caveat to some extent. Now, two smaller points. They're, they're policy, they're not directly related to any tools that may you may want to consider when you're implementing backup on a client, a workstation level. You probably don't want to back up the Dropbox folder. I mentioned this the other day, but really it's any other folder that syncs uh, service, as they almost always provide some kind of virgin backup server side for you. You'd also be doing them a favor by not leaving the synced folder at the root of their home folder with the allow traverse permissions set, which lets any other user on the local system view the contents of files at the root of that folder and Google Drive. Where do I turn that off in Google Drive's interface? Right, so I want to move that folder, right? Wouldn't I go to the client and tell it, hey, move the folder? Once you install it, it does not do that. Uh, same with Dropbox. Only box.com <laughs> maps to a folder in, in documents by default. It wants to make a new folder there. And it would be a little better if the box service was actually intuitive to use, uh, in my opinion. But that's, I guess, besides the point. So also, what some may consider a plus of CrashPlan's client on the Mac, uh, it does get tickled to pick up new files when it's backing up files in real time with the same service that Spotlight uses, the metadata service, right? Which may be a negative for some that find Spotlight less than reliable. I love it when it re-indexes. That means it's a day that ends in day, right? Is that, is that how the joke goes? Um, and I'm sorry if you guys are cold in here. I've turned on warm D. I'm sorry. So. On the server side, it's all web-based and Ajaxy and Web 2.0e because when you're a company that wants to feel hip, you call yourself a startup, right? And uh, you use Web 2.0 stuff. But the cool thing about Black, you can't do this with Blue because they're not going to let you run an API against their hosted service. That would kind of be somewhat intensive. Uh, you can take advantage of their API, which you know it's exposed right there at the URL, API Doc Viewer if you want to get the docs on it at any time. You don't need to go and search anywhere. It's there on the server that's running your CrashPlan Black service. Without you know logging in and waiting for Ajax to refresh and, and be hip and happening or emailing you a report or something like that. I mean, here's a one-liner that I came up with uh, just last week. Uh, to get status across a bunch of clients without sending a report, you know, logging in or doing all that other stuff. So. Break this down uh, from the end. I'm using awk. I'm saying either name or last completed backup. Like those are the two pieces of information. It'll go consecutively when I get a return from this command. Uh, I'm curling uh, with silence. So don't give me any errors. Like don't tell me about any errors that you might have. Uh, if I have a self-signed cert, please go ahead and ignore that. Of course, you'll do this over the LAN. You don't necessarily need to query it over the LAN. 
uh, I'm the user, this local admin to be able to authenticate, uh, and I'm getting all of the computers that the crash plan server knows about. And I need to have the role of sysadmin as an implementation detail to be able to get this list out. So not just anybody over HTTP or HTTPS can, can get this information. And this whole RESTful API interaction I'm talking about underlines the model point that I was trying to make. Back when I mentioned that laptops, you know, they're not leashed to a, de a desk with an Ethernet cable anymore quite often. You have to assume that a web interface is going to be the most compatible across platforms and the most performant is my favorite imaginary word uh, across the WAN when you're going to go and check on it, when you're going to go and optimize for certain use cases like people who travel. I don't know. They work when they travel. Who's, who's taking that into account for their model? Ar ArcAware P5 almost completely is configured in web pages, even on the local client. And that might seem weird. Trust me, you get over it. It's, it's like, it's okay because, again, you can drive it with scripts in the command line and it's performant. Versus crash plan, which is weird. You need to click on the house and then you get like a command line that pops up and then you're in a Java terminal window and it's like, okay, but, uh, you don't really need to do that all that often from the command line on a client locally. You can do a lot of that interaction server side that you would be doing that. Uh, you're doing in the way of maintenance on clients that have backups that you're concerned about. And I have a stuff load of time. <laughs> I, uh, I plowed through that a little bit quicker than I was expecting. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to mention one last product. This is why you have accordion sections in your presentation so that you can pull it out just a little bit and slow down your speaking. Uh, but for bare metal, right, I've talked about an archive use case where you take data and you put it to near line or offline. I've talked about client, like home folder use case when I want to do the most efficient way of sending that data out and getting it archived with versions over time. But then there's, you know, bare metal. So we've had great success with Carbon Copy Cloner. It's powered by rsync. He's not holding anything back. The wizard behind the curtain is there. It's his own particularly swizzled and patched version of rsync, but uh, he's not holding it back, and there's the public forums you can look through for the exact switches that he's using. Uh, we're covering the bare metal use case here. So there are things that you need to go through when you're testing your restore. It's easy when it's a client workstation's files. You can just open the file in the native application. You're done, right? It opens. I can interact with it. It's not going to blow up on me. So I'm sure there's certain use cases, plugins, filters in more complex applications, but you can still kind of tell when it opens and the system doesn't crash that everything might be okay. Databases, not so much. Server backups, not so much. And when we can't snapshot these things over time from a file system that wants to be aware of the state of a running machine, the hard computer science problems, you need downtime. You need a maintenance period, you need to schedule it, and you need to semi-manually take this backup, shove it back into the system while you take the rest of the, the entire you know, local system offline so that nobody interacts with stale data from the backup, and that's how you're verifying it. You can do a bare metal backup, but databases don't like that so much. You want to have those separate processes per database you know, system that, that a database is powering, and that's how you're going to be verifying a backup uh, with a restore. And unfortunately, that is a semi-manual interaction process. But getting that bare metal system up underneath it, uh, the way I like to describe uh, Carbon Copy Cloner is it kind of lifts the house so you can replace the rugs, and it doesn't even matter, it just puts the house back down. And you've got a copy of the entire thing. It's just photocopied the entire system while the house was lifted up in the air and it places it on back down. You can even say over time, kind of like Time Machine, you'll make folders of what's changed, source or destination, and move those into archive folders by date. So certainly not enterprise class or deployed at enterprise level because, again, the perfect use case for it is every bit on the system efficiently going over someplace else, but every bit on the system. And our sync has been hungry for system resources. It is not necessarily the most tuned of processes, 
when it comes to not eating up all of your CPU. It becomes a CPU intensive process as it does that comparison across files. In my experience, I'm sure it can be tuned. I'm sure if you look at that binary, you'll find the switches. There's a voluminous man page. But I, uh, I do not give presentations when I said, would you like to read the man pages? One, two, three, four. Okay, have a good brownie, folks. Uh, and so that is my spiel about carbon copy cloner. We have 20 minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Alistair, I wanted to emphasize um, something that I've seen over the years um, of managing backups of, of map server systems and remake server systems is you started with backup exec and then we found out that it's GFN, the GFS engine only restored as like 10 megabits per second of WAN. And that woke me up to the fact that um, a backup seems to be a fetish in and of itself. It's the purpose of a backup is to be able to restore. Yeah. And, um, you're not creating value if you're just running a program that takes up resources and sends bits. And I just wanted to emphasize that. That kind of seems obvious until the time comes when a disaster recovery hits. You're like, oh my god, it's going to work. OMG, WTF, BBQ. <laughs> in our case, Crash plan, we were backing up a 22 terabyte server um, store. The server, the, 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 the RAID systems collapsed under 101 degree um, data center temperatures. And we were able to restore and get people back online within 10 minutes of the temperature coming down. And it, but it took a full 30 days to get all of the data back across. But um, the the restore big data, big problems. Right, and, and 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 to that end, if you're talking big data, you probably don't want a backup. You probably actually want a replica. So you want a snapshot. You want a disaster recovery site that data is synced to. There are continuous data protection devices because they'll sell you a device for anything these days. So your device to take the spam out of your mail. It's the Oracle will power Iron Man. Like anything that you want to want to have happen. Um, I just, yay, I have something else to talk about. Okay, so, crash plan, however, you have ACLs and permissions on those files in the archive. Everything is fine when there's one user that you're backing up. If you're backing up a server with crash plan, you will recreate those ACLs after the restore. It's what you would do anyway. You have your server administrators. You're, you are the system admin, right? You know what the ACLs are supposed to be. So just ignore the fact that it's lost it when it does that backup, when it sucked it out of the system. It can't track that particular metadata because that's not the use case. Yes, it will restore things right in place with the original position, permissions if you're on that running system. Not so much with the more complex things that servers have features for when it comes to tracking metadata. They have, they're totally open about it. They have a knowledge base, the fact that, like OmniGraffle, who in here, and I'm sorry, I don't like polling audiences, but portable uh, home directories. Anybody use those in the past? Anybody run OmniGraffle ever when that was running? And had that file replaced with a zero kilobyte file because the sync process did not understand a bundle file. The first version of pages. A bundle file, not particularly efficient to move over a network and have continuously every 15 minutes trying to sync while you're working on it. So that was a little trouble prone. But uh, Crash Plan has taken that into account and can understand that it's restoring a bundle and it will, it will sprinkle the magic dust over it. And there's like 16 files types like that, including OmniGraffle, including the entire iWork suite uh, that it does know how to restore. So yeah, I had two other topics. I told I should have put down my presentation. Um, we use, but well, we still use for whole We still use ten six eight server. Mm -hmm. um, is there? I think uh, one of the guys who did the, the server. We're, we're gonna make an image of the deploy studio, but he said I made an image. It, it ripped some stuff out. Did it work? We want to be to restore correctly. What would you recommend as a good backup for certain like ten six eight server to be able to restore back or even? Specific files is really important stuff in uh, So plug, plug. Uh, oh yeah, I should have uh, 
the series of tubes hooked up to my computer before I should try to call up web pages, right? Um, let's see what happens. Oh, this, there's no way this is happening, is it? I'll use my MiFi. That'll help everybody else. <laughs> um, so, if you go to github.com slash dev318, there's what's called SA Backup. SA Backup has OD Backup uh, integrated in it, uh, and I still love the heck out of SA Backup because it's one of the few ways you can programmatically check a bunch of server services. Come on, AT&T. Um, from the series of tubes. Uh, what it does is you set up a launch daemon job that is bundled with the installer. The installer might not have made it across to, to GitHub. It might still be on the SourceForge page that's linked from GitHub. Uh, you then customize that launch daemon job with just where you want the backup to go and what your schedule is going to be. By default, it's once a week. And you can therefore have OD a snapshots taken of it, shoves it into a sparse image folder. You're setting the password in a configuration file that's on your server. This is a separate password that you're creating the archive with. You might want to rotate that on a regular basis. It lives in not necessarily clear text, but binary plist. Uh, yeah, this is never going to work. But anyway. Uh, so that's a database that's important to back up, and 10.6 is exactly right for the updated versions. Uh, 10.7, 10.8, we're told to trust Time Machine for at least doing that sparse image creation part. And the great thing about that automated process is, so you have all of your users and passwords in, in, in password wow. server, right? So when Time Machine <laughs> creates that sparse backup, what password does it put on the sparse backup folder? None. There you go. There it is. So you can move that around and it will be totally. Unless you check the box and encrypt your time machine backup. The sparse image itself, though. So if somebody has your time machine backup open, uh, they can get to all of the contents of that sparse image. You, the, traditional way of creating an archive is you were forced to make a password. And the great thing about 10.8 uh, server, when you create a archive uh, with it, uh, if you don't hit return and close the window once, it forgets your password. So the GUI is awesome in Mountain Lion server. Mountain Lion server FTL. So yeah, I've talked for long enough that uh, we're there. So fast? Who's that guy? Anyway, uh, so that's the SourceForge site where there's the installer. This is the actual script that runs it. If you want to look at any differences that may have happened since uh, Lion and Mountain Lion, even though it was updated 100% for Lion, uh, and Mountain Lion is not so a uh, different beast that it can't be used for that purpose. But again, I'm talking about the fact that, OK, We've got archives and we're taking stuff offline and we know that all of our data is going to maintain fidelity in the backup. We've got incremental and workstation backup where we can do a restore of that file and it's in the native application it was created in and everything's hunky-dory. Then we have databases and if you're supporting Mac OS X server, this is not just open directory, it's called SA backup for server admin. All of the preference files for all of the services that you've configured in 10.6, 10.7, 10.8. It will take those plists and it will do that export as if you went into the GUI and you said export granularly per service. Importing, however, is not particularly uh, automatable. You can still go into the GUI and we did import a heck of a lot besides DHCP scopes of all the random stuff in the world. That's the only thing that we when found. You uh, when you restore, you have to point to... You have to point the server admin GUI. You have to say, hey, I want to restore a service. Uh, I want to import, uh, import a file. And then you, you point it at the plist that are in that archive that is encrypted wherever you stored it, and you reopen it back up, and you'll see all those files in there. And it logs to, to uh, system.log. Yes, ma'am.
So if you have multiple servers that you want to be able to spin up with a particular SLA of like a day, <laughs> hours, continuous data protection devices. They should be, should, so should, platform agnostic. They should be metadata agnostic because all they should care about is blocks because that's the only way it's going to be able to efficiently move that to DR sites anyway. Uh, that's you, Trust but verify, I believe, is a Ronald Reagan quote, right? So uh, you can, with rsync, do very complex things. And in the cloud, uh, there's a company like Rackspace. When they dynamically increase your storage allocation, they're moving your stuff with rsync. Uh, and it's, it feels very dynamic and it's dumb quick because it's all within their data center with really great 10 gig pipes between them. If you have a gigabit connection between your sites, maybe rsync will get you most of the way there. And there's no way that you can't try to script that. Uh, YMMV. Uh, but continuous data protection, uh, there's a product from Dell, of course. There's a product from uh, even freaking SonicWall, which Dell now owns. Uh, you'll pardon me that there aren't more that are at the, the tip of my lips. Does anybody else know continuous data protection devices? I mean, there's clustered storage devices with NAS. I'm sure that um, um, NetApp has something like that geolocation type thing where, or, or like multi-homing type thing where they can you drop it in one place, it spreads out to multiple. Any other questions? Sir? Um, Crash Plan Pro uh, uh, mm -hmm. not using their hardware. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it is like chocolate and peanut butter. It's, it's not hard. It's not difficult. Uh, like, black is, is not a problem. To, like, first, you get chat support. Second, you get a dedicated phone number now. It used to be bad to get in touch with their support. There was a dark period, talking about black. Uh, we've, we've left that period. Uh, getting it on your own infrastructure is, is not hard. You just need to keep into account the fact that there's bandwidth going on. There's clients that you need to deploy, and that's not particularly difficult. You can automate the heck out of that. They've automated since the 2.0 version, we're now on 3 some, uh, or like the 2010 version was easier to deploy at scale. But uh, So from the entire process, the entire interaction, I need to plan my capacity. I want to then balance it. If it gets too much, it's automated within it, then it will push those archives to, to new storage for you. If you want to have multiple homes, you can rsync it first. That's the only thing they don't really kind of do for you. They, they want to do the pushing of an archive from one place to another to have a, another destination take over because then they'll allocate the users properly for you that were assigned to that storage. And you can mix and match. You can split up these users go, going over there. Those users get less space over here. It's a really somewhat easy dynamic thing, uh, yet I'm sure there's still stuff that Mr. Joseph Wall will talk about tomorrow. Maybe. Any other questions? Sir? Does XProtect shut down the version of Java that's bundled with it? Had XProtect shut down the version of Java? Not, not that I recall. Uh, did people who upgraded to Java 7 get burned? Yes. So it's kind of like uh, Dr. It Hurts when I raise my hand, but I totally understand that people needed to deploy Java 7 and then they got burned and it's like, well, I need to use Java 7. It's not like uncommon to have that uh, you know, a developer who really needs the best for you to be able to interact with their systems. They need the newest because, gee, new always means better. Um, so the there was a the Java Seven incompatibility where it got shot down, and since Crash Plan was mapped to Java that wasn't trusted by the system, I'm assuming what it is. I do not know for for 100% certain, but since it's bundled with a client that you've installed, the entire package is trusted. So it just maps that internal version of Java rather than trusting the path to Java 7 that had been shut down. Now it just says, hey, I only need Java 6 anyway. I have a patched version of Java 6. I'm going to maintain it. Because really, I want to continue to function. Semi-important. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, we use ArcWare. Uh, ArcWare's Prestor slash P5. 
Um, my network, the window network I'm in, uh, we use it for the Windows side. You said we should consider just buying the client for the Mac side. Oh, yeah. So that also resolve in OD and interview if we ever need to install that package. If databases are quiet when you're lifting the entire house and moving the carpet out from underneath them, then databases will land quietly. I wouldn't want to mess with it. That's why I have a database, right? It's a complex data set, a complex data structure for me to interact with. So, trust but verify. I mean, yes. twice a year is not too much to ask for a maintenance period to have buy-in where I'm going to take everybody offline. Nobody can talk to this database. I'm sorry. We have databases because we can run really efficiently off of them, but I can't restore them without a continuous data protection device that understands all those databases and gets it all right uh, without actually verifying it in situ, in real use. So having that period where everything can be quiet when you have a scheduled event rather than an unscheduled event uh, that's going to make your life a lot easier. If you do not rehearse, you will not be ready on game day. And it's an unfortunate time when you have scattered showers inside the server. Any other questions? Any backup products? Any command line utilities that anyone want to share anything besides CP, TAR, Ditto, RSync, anything else? TMUtil, FTW? All right, you guys get to have cookies. Thank you kindly. <laughs>